Hello and welcome back to the Geodynamics video lectures on viscous deformation and the strength of the lithosphere. Here in lecture number two, we're going to look at nonlinear viscous deformation. And our only goal in this lecture is to describe nonlinear viscous deformation, uh, how it arises and where it comes from in terms of uh, the behavior of rocks in the earth, and then later on in this video lecture set, we'll talk about some applications. Now, the basic idea is that most rocks actually don't behave as Newtonian or linear viscous materials. Uh, rock salt is close to linear viscous, but it's sort of unique in that aspect. Most rocks aren't. And so my question for you at this point is, can you come up with any reasons why rocks might not be linear viscous materials? Maybe it's easier to think about this in terms of why rocks might not have a constant viscosity, uh, perhaps as you go deeper into the earth. So pause the video for a second, think about that, and come back when you have an idea. Okay, so let's see what you've come up with. Well, there's basically two main reasons why rocks don't have a constant viscosity within the earth. The first is that rock viscosity is strongly temperature dependent. And you can see an example in this schematic diagram over here where rock strength is indicated by the differential stress, uh, sigma d, which is just the difference between the largest and smallest principal stresses. And that's plotted then as um, against increasing temperatures or, well, it's really depth, but as we know, temperature increases within the earth. And what you can see here is that the viscous strength of quartz in this case is decreasing significantly as you go deeper into the earth and as the rocks heat up. Now, mathematically, that relationship is shown here where rock viscosity is shown to be a function of A0, which is a pre-exponent constant, that's a material property, times an exponential function where the exponential is uh, includes the activation energy divided by the gas constant R and temperature in Kelvins. And so you can see it's this E to the something over temperature that gives you that exponential decrease in strength or exponential decrease in viscosity of rock with increasing temperatures. A second reason for the nonlinearity in viscous deformation of rock actually is simply a function of the material itself. Rock doesn't generally deform in a linear manner. Um, and what that means is that uh, if you look at the plot here of stress versus strain rate for a linear viscous material, we expect to see straight lines on here. And for most rocks, we don't observe that behavior. Okay, let's see what that looks like mathematically. And then we'll go back to this, um, to this figure. So what this means is that we have um, rock where you have a shear stress in the rock to some power n and that power n gives you this power law behavior that we commonly observe in rock deformation. That is then equal to something where we would have had viscosity before, that's viscosity eta has been replaced by an A uh, effective, which is a material constant, and, uh, and then that's multiplied by the strain rate. Now this A effective is actually very much like viscosity, except it has units of pascals to the n seconds rather than pascal seconds, so we use a different um, different variable name here, um, just to make this clear. Now, the general idea here is that most rocks will deform about eight times as fast when you double the stress. So if this is a power law exponent, and typically for rock it's going to be something like two to four, you could take some stress here, and if you double that stress, and it's raised to the power three, for instance, that's going to result in eight times as fast of a strain rate if the material constant doesn't change. Now, if we go back over to our plot here on the right, you can see kind of how this works. Um, you know, for our linear viscous material, we had the straight line here, where increasing stress just results in a linear increase in the strain rate. Now, if you consider one of these nonlinear cases, for instance, n equals three, so this is the finely dashed line, you can see initially when you increase the stress, there's very little increase in the strain rate. And then 
at a certain point, the strain rate begins to increase and it increases very rapidly. And so if the stress level you consider here, for instance, is maybe halfway between zero and five on this vertical axis, it's maybe somewhere here, you can see that we've got a strain rate of about one and uh, maybe you know one or two. If you double the stress, in this case, to go up to the dashed line five, you can see that the strain rate has gone up to something like 10. And so that's where this doubling of stress resulting in eight times as much deformation comes from. And in the extreme case, you get the perfectly plastic behavior that we talked about in the last lecture set, where essentially there's no deformation until you reach a critical stress level, at which point you then have the ability to deform an infinite amount. And so you can see that as you're going to higher and higher uh, values for this power law exponent, you're kind of approaching this perfectly plastic behavior where you have a longer period of time where you're able to apply stresses and have no deformation, and then it rapidly um, curves over. Now, the units for this effective, um, this material constant A effective, are kind of unusual, Pascal to the n seconds. Uh, so it's often easier, you can actually calculate an effective viscosity, which is simply dividing the stress by the strain rate, or taking A effective to the one over n power, and then multiplying that by the strain rate to the one over n minus one power, which gives you the same thing and uh, will perhaps make it a little bit easier to relate the um, effective viscosity to viscosities of other materials that are perhaps more familiar. So we can put these two types of nonlinear behavior together. And so we can combine the temperature dependence and the nonlinearity in the material uh, in what's called uh, commonly Dorn's law. And so this will give us basically the combined power law viscosity and the Arrhenius relationship, that temperature dependence. Um, and it puts it in terms of differential stress, which I'll just remind you again, is this, the difference between sigma one and sigma three, the largest and smallest principal stresses. So what it looks like is that we have the differential stress equals the strain rate over A to the power one over N, and so this would be the material nonlinear behavior times the exponential uh, to the Q over NRT. And so here is that temperature dependent behavior. A, Q, and N are all things that you can get from rock mechanics experiments. So these would just be parameters that have been uh, derived from uh, experiments if you were to try and do some kind of simulations using these. Uh, these numbers. Now, uh, the plot over here on the left basically shows how this Dorn's law works. You can see here we have temperatures increasing on the vertical axis, and then this is the log of the strain rate. And so, um, strain rates of uh, 10 to the minus 16 to 10 to the minus 12 um, are plotted here, and those would be in typically something like per second. So, how does it work? Well, you could think about it this way. First off, let's consider a case of constant temperature, maybe 400 degrees, and uh, then we'll talk about what these contour lines mean here. If you were to hold a rock at a constant temperature and increase the strain rate in there, what you're going to see is that the stress within the rock is going to increase as well. So these contour lines are contours of the differential stress within the rock. And so if you're at 400 degrees and you went from 10 to the minus 16 to 10 to the minus 12 per second, you're going to see increasing levels of stress within the rock. Alternatively, if you were to hold a constant strain rate, if you're just constantly squeezing the rock and go to higher temperatures, what you would see is that uh, the differential stress in the rock would go down. In other words, the rock is, uh, is weaker. And that makes sense because rock at near surface temperatures is generally stronger than rock when you put it to um, higher temperatures within the earth. So if you're just constantly squeezing your rock and you're increasing temperature with time, what you'll see is that the rock is going to be weaker. 
and that comes straight from this relationship. These contour lines are simply um, plots of this differential stress value that you would calculate with this relationship. So hopefully that gives you some idea of how the combination of the nonlinear behavior of the material and the temperature dependence work together in rocks. Okay, so now it's time to take your quiz once again, and then we'll come back and we'll continue talking about um, rock deformation, but now looking at things in an atomic scale view.